bright and early this morning. And if you haven't already figured it out, this is a fundraiser for the college. <laughs> I'm going to stand behind there, and, and, and um, the guys who are here, you know, this is make a great gift for you. Who are here, you, you can spend the money before you go home. Um, and then, um, great to have Jim and Jackie on campus, um, and without further ado, uh, I, I add my welcome to all you early risers. It always impresses me. <laughs> I want to thank James Naughton, who's here this morning, uh, from BNY uh, Mellon Wealth Management, our generous sponsor, and the Friends of Concordia, who make this program possible. And I'm delighted to welcome Jim Bond, Chief Marketing Officer of Brahmin, the Massachusetts-based handbag and accessory company. Jim has built a career growing business in the high-end consumer goods sector. He started in the heyday of the department store, recruited by Estee Lauder companies, where he spent 14 years first as regional marketing director of Clinique for Clinique, eventually moving to London, where he ran Clinique in the UK, before returning to the US to run Prescriptives, another of Louder's brands. He moved back to Clinique, where he oversaw their 14 international department store markets, which included the UK, South Africa, the Pacific Rim from China to Australia. Jim then joined the Calvin Klein Cosmetics Company, where he oversaw 10 brands before leaving the cosmetics industry to return to accessories, becoming the executive vice president of global marketing and sales for La Sports Sac. There, he led the explosive growth of the brand throughout Asia. Jim's vast experience spans such recognizable names as Clinique, Calvin Klein, La Sports Sac, and LAMD, the brand he launched with singer Gwen Stefani. In 2008, Jim was tapped by Brahmin, a name synonymous with quality and style and his goal has been to make Brahmin as well known as any of the other brands he has helped build by making a product timeless in style, ageless in appeal, and accessible in its pricing. One might say he has that goal in the bag. <laughs> his remarkable international career is in no small measure attributable to his personal style and character. Jim exudes energy, enthusiasm, and a positive attitude that is inspiring. Finding opportunity in every challenge is not a cliche with Jim. It has proved, it's been a proven path to his successful international business career. Please welcome Jim Bond. Good morning. Thanks very much for, for coming. Um, knowing the roster of distinguished speakers who preceded me, I decided, ooh, I want to share my experience in turning stress to success with you so that maybe you can be a little inspired to turn your stresses into successes too. Let me begin by saying I am not a doctor. I'm not a professor. Uh, I don't even have a marketing degree. All my skills have been acquired. And this is kind of important because it factors into what I want to tell you. I encountered stress, not, not unlike many or most of us, in some form or another at a very early age. My parents were successful as my dad climbed the corporate ladder back in the 50s until suddenly he lost his job due to a change in management. You know, they brought in their own team. He did nothing wrong. He was simply the victim of a corporate culture. Many of us know what that's like. However, it's what he didn't do next that changed my lo family's lives forever. Always the rising star, he found himself unable to cope with his setback, and unfortunately, he turned to the bottle. My mother had to return to teaching just to keep us afloat. Going from having to not having was really stressful for us. Imagine in a neighborhood like this. And I decided that I was going to have to earn what I wanted to have. Starting in the summer of the sixth grade, I cut lawns, trimmed hedges, babysat, <laughs> delivered newspapers, and did any odd job I could to earn the spending money that I wanted to have to run with my friends. I was 12. In the winters, I shoveled snow, babysat, did errands, delivered my newspapers, and <clears throat> a paper route I had for seven straight years. And I know you're wondering when I studied. Well, I did that in between the cracks, but somehow I always managed to be on the honor roll. I always had a girlfriend. I never missed the school dances. I was active on the student council, an ardent Boy Scout, and very active in our church. I bought all my own clothes so that I could run with my friends in the influent neighborhood where we lived, 
And in fact, I actually bought clothes for my kid sister at the time so she could have the things that her friends had too. Things seemed to go well. I didn't really know the difference, even though my dad just didn't seem to make a go of anything he tried to do in business until one day my mother was the victim of a very bad car accident. We were told that she may not even recognize us. She would definitely never walk again. And we faced a new reality, a stressful reality, one that we all took on willingly. And I had to rise to the occasion. The reality of curtailing one's own life, one's own activities, okay, in order to take care of my family while my father sat at my mother's bedside literally 24-7. I had just turned 16 years old. Days turned into weeks, which turned into months, and eventually she actually recognized us. Even, even though she was in traction in the hospital with multiple fractures and could only move her head just a little bit, she decided she wanted to continue with the postgraduate work that she had started prior to her accident. Most likely she was motivated by the looming debt of the mounting hospital bills she was racking up although she never admitted that to me or anyone else as far as I know, certainly not to my father. We affixed her research books to her overhead traction in the bed every day. And during my lunch period and after school, every day I sat by her bedside waiting for her to tell me when to turn the page and I took detailed notes as she spoke. I was excited as she was when she, or maybe a little bit of we, completed her master's degree with all A's. After we had her afternoon study sessions, I delivered my newspapers, my good old paper route, my steady source of income. All my customers had agreed with, by prior arrangement to a later delivery time so that I could be with my mother after school every day. I went home, I cooked dinner, did my homework, tried to make sure that my younger brother and sister did their homework and finally called it a day. My stressful home life and daily routine taught me how to juggle time, prioritize, multitask, manage others, control money, what little there was of it, and do for others first. And in the wake of my hard work and determination to help my family, I even learned such life skills as grocery shopping, laundry, cooking, ironing, because I had to. I had no choice. <coughs> In essence, I just learned to do anything that I set my mind to. Not necessarily well at first, but, you know, determination gets you there. All these newly acquired skills would, would later pay off. Eventually, my mother came home, where we turned our downstairs into a hospital ward. She actually began to work again as a guidance counselor, thanks to her master's degree but chauffeured every day, unable to drive, by yours truly. She eventually started pursuing her PhD, and after months of months of physical therapy and aided by a walker, she actually was able to, to walk again. She was just so determined and probably driven, driven by our stressful living situation. From her, I learned that you can do anything, absolutely anything, if you try hard enough. And I also learned about stress. I learned to look stress right in the eye and de determine what was it about stress that caused it in the first place. And was I going to try to defeat the stress or embrace the stress? Armed with my inflated can-do attitude, <laughs> I went off to college and after studying three languages in high school, I decided I wanted a career in the Foreign Service. I wanted to see the world. So I put myself through, through college. I always had a job, sometimes full time. And five years later, <coughs> excuse me, including a fully uh, self-funded study abroad in Columbia, South America, and a work-study trip to Europe for which I had to take student loans, I earned my master's degree. And I thought I was ready to go straight to the United Nations. I soon learned, however, that even with my mountains of determination, I didn't have the skill set to compete with Ivy League degrees or those who had grown up in naturally bilingual and even trilingual households. Talk about stress. I was engaged to Jackie with our wedding date looming 
and unemployed in an era much like today's. Not enough jobs for the new graduates, high unemployment because the Vietnam War had just ended. Uh, the the uh, draft was abolished, so I wasn't a vet, I wasn't disabled, and I wasn't anything. So undaunted, I took the one job offer I had as a temporary stopgap. It was with a department store in Washington, D.C. And it was in their management training program. I thought, what better place to start my international career when things got better than being in Washington, D.C.? The drawback was that the job that I was starting in the training program was in the operations division, and it was in the food service department. There I was in a kitchen, <laughs> learning about food costs, labor overheads, inventory controls, not exactly an international resume builder, I thought. But something happened. I knew I had no choice. Again, I faced that stress, and I just worked hard. And then I found out I liked it. It was unbelievable. I was learning, I was stimulated, I was growing. My first assignment was to run a little pub in the store that the store had just to attract male shoppers. And they wanted to build a lunch clientele and you know, keep the men in the store. So I used it also to target an after work shopper. This was a long time ago, so happy hour, you know. <laughs> Armed only with my basic cooking skills, very basic and a reasonable amount of pub experience from my college days, <laughs> I simply and unknowingly applied some basic marketing principles, and here's where I found out I liked marketing. I looked at this pub through consumers' eyes. I analyzed what sold, what didn't, and why. And then I made the appropriate changes needed to attract more customers. Simple things like improving the menu, the service, the portions, the presentations, real basics. But soon, the pub became a profit center rather than just the service center it was intended to be to keep shoppers in the store. Up at 4.30 a.m. every day so that I could catch a bus into downtown Washington, D.C. and be there by 6 a.m., I had a stressful learning curve. We know how college kids don't like to get up early. <laughs> My ability to see trends, however, Focus on consumer be, uh, behavior and buying patterns started to merge, and then it started to pay off as I rapidly progressed through various areas of the department store. I became a sponge to learn and improve any area to which I was assigned, having gone from food service to men's clothing <coughs> to the home store, and then on to my favorite area to fashion. This is where my career really began to take off because early on I learned that I did better in any area that wasn't one that I would take so personally and I liked, I was always called a clothes horse in college. I liked men's too much. I couldn't be as objective. My first assignment in fashion was to be the assistant buyer of ladies swimwear. <laughs> <coughs> Somebody had to do it. You know, <clears throat> my daily routine was so busy, which is different from stressful. Dealing with advertising, suppliers, customers, stores, management, it was really mind-boggling, and I loved it. Who says men can't multitask? I learned that we could buy goods that women actually wanted because we did it by offering customers the fashion selection that, that, that were out there, not goods simply at the lowest possible price. My determination, common sense, and hard work paid off, and I was promoted. Soon I found myself on foreign buying trips, negotiating in foreign currencies, and dealing in different time zones. I couldn't believe that my dream of an international career was actually starting to happen. Although it was in business versus government, and actually I stopped thinking about government at this point, and I found out I was good at it. More importantly, I really liked what I did. Who would have believed that my early successes in the store's food service <clears throat> would lead to a career in fashion all because I embraced a stressful situation? Uh, that was throwing myself into the only job I had because there was no choice. Here's where I had to hone my senses for marketing, however, because suddenly I was responsible for, pla for placing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of orders that I thought would sell, primarily because I really wanted them to. To whom? Why? 
For what price? Stressful? You bet. Did I make mistakes? <laughs> you bet. Everything I did was big at the time because I bought too much. But fortunately, I developed a fashion taste level, learned that I could really spot some fashion trends and translate them into successful buys. And I had no problem taking fashion risks. My successes far outweighed my failures, fortunately. And for the first time since I was 16 years old, instead of being the support system at home, I actually had one, Jackie. <coughs> She was also a buyer, but her strength was on the financial side of the business uh, versus on the marketing side, the way mine was. Her tutorials late at night at the kitchen table were <laughs> lifesavers at the time until I acquired the financial skills that I needed from her to make fashion profitable. Things went really well and both of our careers took off and eventually I was recruited by another department store, Jordan Marsh. So we moved to Florida vowing to save ourselves from burnout by not working more than 1,000 hours a week. <laughs> you know, after building my experience on the store side of the business at Jordan Marsh, by becoming a general manager, I really felt I was on my way to becoming a department store principal. My career took an unexpected turn, however, when I was offered the position of regional marketing director for Clinique, one of the Estee Lauder brands. And it was because of my successful cosmetics business in the branch store I was managing. It turned out I found and supported businesses that women like to repeat and replenish, such as hosiery at the time and cosmetics, and then I could entice them with something else. It was a lot easier than trying to go directly to the enticing route. Things went from good to great and Jackie retired. We started a family. Both of our sons, Chap and Brian, were born. But I have to admit, suddenly I faced another kind of stress. The stress of going from two people on two incomes to four people on one income. <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong, I was doing okay. But I was just feeling the normal stresses that come with the responsibilities of starting a family. But the boys made up for it. And having Jackie at home as our anchor allowed me to meet the travel demands of my job head on and really throw myself into it. My work flourished and soon we were transferred, as Ellen said, to, Lund to London to run the Clinique uh, brand in the United Kingdom. The boys were one and four. We sold our completely remodeled house in Fort Lauderdale, our dream house, so to speak, that we lived in for 10 months and off we went to England. Unfortunately, my father passed away <coughs> at the time, but my recently retired mother was able to visit us three times in the four years we lived there. We were so proud of her and how she got around. Every day I pinched myself that my dream of an international career was actually coming true. I found myself competing with other brands, of course, fighting for market share, but I also found myself competing with other international markets within Clinique for growth. It was what business was all about, and I found that what could have been stressful was actually very stimulating. What was so different about my Clinique experience in the UK? Because we actually pioneered a lot of consumer research that told us that she was actually attracted by the fact that Clinique products were allergy tested and fragrance free. But what astounded us were the ages, income, and education levels of our consumers, even though Clinique isn't pricey as, as the other brands are in department stores and often thought of as very young. Jackie was always my resident consumer. When I started in cosmetics, I didn't know the difference between a lipstick and a mascara. <laughs> so she provided me with a lot of intelligence that I could apply, just common sense. She called herself my woman on the street at home <laughs> <laughs> that we, and in marketing clinique. So I set to work applying the consumer knowledge we gained to improve our business. We spoke to our consumers, including men, that clinique was actually the intelligent choice good for you and made it fun. We intentionally never mentioned the brand's affordability in any of our marketing efforts. Talk about stress, here I was abroad, an internationally unknown, aka crazy American, running the fourth largest clinic market in the world during the Thatcher era. <laughs> A time when Jackie's and my mo personal mortgage payments for our house that we bought in England doubled due to the bad economy and the fact that fixed rate mortgages didn't exist. I can really relate to the stress of being house poor, as many Americans are now, 
and it reminded me of my childhood. That first year in England, although a great experience, was really rough on us as a family. But we had no choice other than to make it work. Did we get stressed out? Yeah, a little bit. But we had to overcome it. So we made our own fun. We played a lot of games as a family and even with our friends because we realized they were all in the same situation. We loved our times in the UK and are still close friends with many of our former neighbors. We grew even closer as a family because we didn't know anybody there at first. Business took off and we gained two rankings in our market share in the first year from sixth place to fourth place. With sales climbing, the business stress, even in tough economic times, started to abate and my PR team and I swung into action. For example, we got Diana and Charles to register on our card file in Harvey Nichols. Diana became such a fan of Clinique that she often wore Clinique. Photographed on the cover of Vogue, a new lipstick shade sold over 60,000 units in a week when she wore it, the amount our previous best-selling shades would sell in a year. Intelligent consumers looked at Diana as young, yes, but also something very key as someone who could have any brand she wanted. Again, reinforcing what we picked up on earlier, the fact that because the brand was so well-priced, it appealed to our consumer's intelligence. We made the brand so desirable that our prices were actually a pleasant surprise. Why spend more when you didn't have to? Editors and consumers alike related. Besides Prince Charles, one of the ways we got attention of British men was shaving the balloons that we had inflated in Harrods to show how smooth a shave could be with our cream shave. <laughs> Knowing that neither he or any British male would volunteer to have a shave on the selling floor of a department store. It paid off. The fashion press loved it and sales of our fragrance-free men's products exploded. In fact, in four years, Clinique became number one in the UK and is still number one 20 years later. As a result, I was repatriated to New York to run Prescriptus Cosmetics, another of the Estee Lauder brands known for its custom color and for its exact match of makeup shades. This was a brand known for also for its innovation, and boy, I was really looking forward to this experience. The fun of being back in the U.S. was marred, however, by my brother's sudden suicide. Knowing that the stress of suffering a personal tragedy like that can distract or even derail someone, especially their career, I had to be very careful. I also wondered how I was going to explain that to my sons who adored him someday, and we did. So I focused on my wonderful family as we settled in here in Bronxville and on my new assignment and prescriptives. Achieving bottom line growth versus top line growth wasn't as much fun as increasing market share had been. And being in the corporate headquarters in the General Motors building of the Esther Lauder brands created a new kind of stress for me, a corporate kind of stress. But I knew that concentrating on improving the brand's profitability would be an invaluable experience. And it really was. After leading Prescriptus into the black for the first time in its 14-year history, it had been sort of a family hobby of Leonard Lauder's, we re I realized it was a must to at least break even because the Lauder Corporation was heading into its IPO. I returned clin to Clinique after that. <clears throat> I, I told Leonard, this wasn't fun, can I go back to Clinique? And he actually said yes. Mm -hmm. I went to run the international markets uh, for the department stores outside, the, outside North America. Here's where my travels took me all over Asia, South Africa, Australia, Europe, back to the UK, me, the guy from the department store kitchen. I think I really would have done this for free. I was so excited to have my international job at last. With my built-in marketing credibility from my UK success, I set out to, to make the Clinique brand number one in all 14 countries that reported to me. There was a new kind of stress in doing that, learning the time zones, the cultures, the hemisphere, the weather conditions, all those things. You can't launch a cream in the winter there because it's summer here. <laughs> You know, the stress was having, also not having enough time to do everything that needed to be done, especially as the new era of specialty dermatologist cosmetics brands was dawning. 
but that stress turned into success too because I then challenged my team. I realized I didn't have to do everything by myself and alone. So we got great energy all over the globe to think differently, find competitive gaps, and always stay consumer focused. And it worked. After opening clinic in China and in Korea, number one in every location where we opened, fixing the post-bubble business in Japan, which was really bad. That's where Clinique was desperately trying to hold on to its already well-entrenched number one position. And that's also where my Thatcher era UK experience really paid off. We became number one in places like Indonesia. Think of your, the skin tone and the ethnicity there. Malaysia, you know, and we readied Hong Kong for the handoff to Chinese rule. I then left the Clinique and the Lauder Corporation after 14 years to join Calvin Klein to head up their Western Hemisphere. Joining Calvin Klein after the biggest single fragrance launch success in history of any company, CK1, where sales topped $100 million in the US alone in its first year, I was lured by this new challenge from the recruiter as well as adding more foreign markets to my belt as well as being responsible for duty-free. I went from a fragrance-free brand to <laughs> fragrance, <laughs> selling products that outperformed our claims to selling products that consumers don't really need. <laughs> but fortunately, they wanted them because they make us feel better. Traveling the hemisphere, wow, was this really happening to me? We galvanized our efforts, reassessed our resources, and rebuilt the market share of our classic fragrance brands. From Argentina to Canada, where my foreign language skills were useful, by the way, it was gratifying to see that our back to classics marketing approach was paying off. And it was in large part due to the black and white ads that were actually outtakes that I had resurrected from old campaigns because we had no money for a new shoot. These brands registered again in the top 10 best-selling fragrance brands in every market in the Western Hemisphere, even though the marketplace was being besieged with new competitive fragrance launches. Stressful? Yes. But our marketing successes were simply the result of listening to, consumer, excuse me, to consumers and identifying that they were tired of grunge and androgyny, what Calvin was known for at the time. However, the dramatic gains we made were not enough to offset the downward spiral of the CK1 juggernaut. Consumers had voted and it was a one-hit wonder. Calvin Klein even went cold as a result as a designer. Ralph Lauren started to burgeon. And so we approached Unilever, who owned the Calvin Klein fragrance license, to acquire other fragrance license brands so that we could build a stable of successful fragrances, and we did, such as Vera Wang and Nautica, and offset the downturn that we were incurring, hemorrhaging actually on the bottom line of Calvin Klein. However, Unilever got tired of investing more monies and put the company up for sale. Even though he had stopped the erosion of our market share, suddenly, along with all the other board members, I was out of a job. I was 50. Like many of us, this was a stress that I always feared and never felt I would actually have to face. Until then, remembering how my father reacted when he suddenly was unemployed, I sat down and I realized that with the help of an outplacement counselor, may she rest in peace, to whom I shall be forever grateful that I had a rich an unusual resume filled with marketing successes, often in the toughest of economic situations all over the globe. I looked in the mirror and I t said to myself, I have no choice. So I turned my stress into energy and determination and five months later I became the head of international and went on to become corporate executive vice president of global sales and marketing for Le Sportsac the handbag and accessories company, where I helped lead the resurgence of the brand until it too was sold five years later. But in those five years, we completely reimaged the brand, making it hip and worn by celebrities. It was a big brand 
internationally, although not as big here. We built hundreds of shops and we actually broke into the top 25 accessories brands along with names like Chanel, Mac, Tiffany's, Coach, Louis Vuitton, and more. I then tried my hand at a venture capitalist-backed endeavor for a year before, before returning to the fashion industry as a partner with the former owner of Le Sportsac and with Gwen Stefani, the, the rock star, as she launched her Lamb handbag and accessories line. Fun, yes, more international travel, this time to the Middle East and Russia, new frontiers for me. I was really excited. More notches on my international belt. But stress, yes. Gwen hadn't become known abroad yet, and we had to move quickly because suddenly we found out she was going to have a baby, <laughs> potentially totally changing her fan base. We made it work, however, by evolving the consumers we were targeting, and soon Lamb became one of the top-selling handbags in, of all places, Nordstrom. Whew. Nothing like the stress of averting becoming another one-hit wonder. Augmenting the Lamb brand with other brands included doing a handbag <laughs> line for Jill Stewart, the New York designer who was big in Asia, and our growth really was tremendous. Creating, managing, sustaining growth are all different endeavors, as you can imagine. But when you're in the fashion business, you have to go full throttle all the time. Sleep with one eye open, I like to say. A kind of stress in and of itself. Your brand has to be noticed, has to be relevant, and has to be fresh in order to grow in the fashion industry at all. That type of stress leads to success if you never let up, literally never let up, and if the stars align, and sometimes they do. As in any business, success leads to success, and one day I got a call from a recruiter who wanted to talk to me about an opportunity to take a handbag brand that's been around for you know, quite a while to the quote-unquote next level, she said. Based on going from a manufacturing mentality to a marketing-driven business plan. I met with them mostly out of curiosity, and the rest is history. I've been at Brahman, New England-based handbag company, as its chief marketing officer for three and a half years. Interesting company. Uh, based, on, based on all of the, uh, you know, the, the foundations of previous brands, you know, good quality product, timeless style, and good pricing, although that's what we don't talk about in our marketing. <laughs> at 60, I work as hard as either of our two sons works, both of whom are four years and two years out of college, busy climbing the corporate ladder, both coincidentally have degrees in marketing, and both are doing very well pursuing their marketing careers. Something else I can't overemphasize as an aside, something that, that allows me to play in the fashion game, known for its unrelenting travel and fast pace, is being fit. 20 years ago, <clears throat> after being sidelined for months with a bad back and always having been a skinny kid, I decided to get fit and stay fit. At a time in the UK when fitness hadn't caught on yet, I risked being accused of being self-indulgent. <laughs> And by hiring a series of trainers and got into shape. To this day, young guys at the gym ask me what I'm training for when they see how hard I work out, and I say, it's just my routine. Being fit equips me better mentally as well as phys physically, <coughs> and it also keeps me more grounded. Ending a busy day at the gym is an ideal way to give stress, to get rid of stress, and to rethink your issues and get grounded. Why do I work so hard? <laughs> I have no choice. You know, and realizing that there's no choice suddenly removes a lot of stress. You just make the best of it, period. So I funnel my efforts instead of woe is me or what can I do, it's let's make it successful, finding good positive solutions. And thankfully, because I love what I do, it's a self-fulfilling cycle. I'm able to deal with the stress of a fast pace because I can utilize my strengths and the skills I've acquired. I'm constantly being challenged. I cannot design a handbag, but as head of the creative and the product development efforts of Brahman, my fashion experience has given me the ability and the confidence to identify what will sell when I see it. 
My job takes me to Europe, to Asia, buying and developing new colors, new leathers, researching fashion trends, so that my marketing skills that I've acquired from my times with the big corporations and my sales and buying experience from my days developing American businesses and foreign markets all come into play as we appeal to three generations of women everywhere. Every day I turn my stressful, hectic, and crazy schedule to successful, rewarding, and satisfying experience where I appreciate every day I appreciate the results of my team and my own efforts. Most of all, I appreciate my wife and my family who've put up with my worldwide travels all these years that have enabled me to throw myself into my job. Even now, as Brahman's headquarters is in Massachusetts, where my office is, and as a result, we've had to have two residences, Jackie especially has enabled me to look forward to going to work every day because every day is full of new stresses. But I view them, as I said, as new challenges and new opportunities. Living and working away from home could have been stressful. We dealt with it. <clears throat> as I said, we purchased a second residence and we treat it like a vacation home. When she comes up on weekends, we, we, we get away from it all and we dearly love it and I love coming home to Bronxville. So it makes splitting our time more fun. However, <clears throat> if I count our two sons, the four of us actually live in four different states. So, <clears throat> so we work hard at remaining the tight family unit that we became many, many years ago when they were little in the UK in those stressful times. This wasn't intended to be the story of my life or my career, but rather a look at how stress turned into success. If we analyze it, and decide to either defeat it, cope with it, or embrace it before it reaches a breaking point. I have always met stress head on. I, and it's because I didn't have a choice. But I learned that the source of stress isn't one-sided. I look in the mirror every day and ask myself, how can I improve? How can I stay fresh? How can I learn more? How can I alleviate the stress of the issues that I'm facing? What are the unresolved problems? How can I help? And so on. Keeping informed, up to date, challenged, and always on the top of one's game gives you the strongest weapons there are against stress. The energy and determination to succeed in overcoming whatever causes you stress, getting to the root of the stress and addressing the cause of it, and as I said, either take it head on creatively and tirelessly until the stress is either minimized or better yet eliminated. We have to recognize and take responsibility for contributing to stress when we overschedule, lack information, run late, don't communicate properly, and so on. Even when I'm busy doing what I love to do, which is traveling extensively, I've always put my family first. I always gave as much time and energy as I could to our church and to our community. What could have been stressful became balance. Before opening up for questions, I want to say that I have no career regrets. I have always addressed stress with a resolve. I constantly reinvent myself and challenge you to do that. I have grown from every down in my life as well as from every up and the ups I take appreciatively and humbly because I believe hubris is the number one enemy of success. Long ago, I adopted the motto from my mom to which my sons will attest, you can do anything if you try hard enough. And I hope you adopt that motto too. We just finished our fall market. We showed our line to the fashion press and to department stores from all over the United States as we work six months in advance, but I brought some of our spring product line to show you <coughs> as this is what's hitting the stores, Lord & Taylor, Nordstrom, Macy's now, because I thought you might like to see it. Um, and I wanted to tell one little story. <coughs> Remember I said I had a self-funded trip back to study my languages in Colombia? Well, <coughs> that was pre-drug cartels, and that was in 1970. 
and my mom had been through so much, I, I really wanted to do something, and I saved all my money, and I brought her this real skin bag. I was so proud of it. I don't think she even particularly cared for it. It didn't even go with her outfit, but I was really proud of this bag. Well, many years later, this bag turned into this bag at Brahmin. <laughs> and it's called the Genie. That was her name. Okay? And <clears throat> it's also an inspiration for other bags in our line to come. But I thought that you could see how kind of one thread leads to another. And this is a perfect example of timeless style for which we like to be known, which is also a very difficult thing to do in today's age, how to stay relevant and fresh and be timeless. It's not an oxymoron. So please come down. I, I, I'd, uh, I'm happy to uh, take any questions, open it up for discussion. You can ask me anything. As you can see, I'm a very open person. Yes? You remind me of our daughter who told me the other day, she's a PhD candidate uh -huh. and has two jobs and teaches yoga and is helping people who are married to post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. folks. She told me that her day is like a, an Excel sheet. She sees every block of time. Mm -hmm. And when something gets out of whack, she borders on stress, but she goes on to the next thing. Yes. I think she takes after her dad, <laughs> uh, which is a good thing. And I'm wondering if you factor genetics into your makeup. I absolutely do, um, in both ways. Uh, my dad, you know, yes, he was an alcoholic and, and really had a lot of problems. Um, and so I was acutely aware of this, but he was high energy. He owned a room when he walked in. It was really, he really was a terrific person. Um, he just couldn't cope with the stress, and of course nowadays, it's, in, in fairness, you can't put today's values or mores or conditions on the past. And um, it was really, he felt like a black sheep, it was really a black mar mark against him, uh, you know, when he was just sort of out of a job. Whereas today, it's like, okay, well, now I'm in the club. You know, so, uh, and my mother on the other hand um, had a very high tolerance for pain and an extremely, uh, she was actually the tough one. Uh, I don't think that you take after her, the genetic. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think both of them. Yeah. Mm. Yes? When you went to England for Clinique, you did a lot of consumer research. Yes. What really triggered giving up the idea of linking affordability to the product? And if I told you... How did you have the will to do that? If I told you, you wouldn't believe it. One day we were watching, one night Jackie and I were watching Hercule Poirot. And this guy came over from the FBI to work with Scotland Yard to catch an international criminal. And the guy was, the bobbies were all lined up and the, you know, this is, you know, back in the 30s. And he goes, all right, you guys, we can go for the big one here. We know how to catch him and da da da. And suddenly I went, that's me. That's an American. We, it was ridiculous. <clears throat> I need to close my mouth and open my ears. So I went and took a completely different approach. I even went out and bought new clothes and started dressing like the Brits. I had never had a double-breasted suit, for example. And by asking questions and probing, suddenly we were on to something. And I realized that is the number one tenet of marketing, is listening to consumers and acting. And it was that kind of, as I said, I, didn't have a I don't have a marketing degree. It was that um, epiphany that happened one night watching TV. Can you believe it? Yes? You say that your wife was your muse. Well, that's not what you say, but I'm reading between the lines. It seems as though you could not have done this amazing thing without her. Absolutely right. <laughs> 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 Absolutely right. If you knew, she would be cooking dinner and hear me doing a deal at the kitchen table, and she'd go, honey, you don't need that many. Don't buy so many. You know, um, a friend of ours who later uh, went on to become the president of the head company department store and then Marshall Fields and is now uh, the head of Ralph Lauren Corporation for the home division, actually he and I were department managers together. And I ran the men's furnishing area, and he ran the men's suits area. And he took over from me when I was promoted uh, 
from being a buyer. And he, he said the first time he walked into the stock room at the downtown Washington DC store, he almost had a heart attack because of all the goods that were there. And he knew they were old, that yeah, they had all been bestsellers, but they were just, there was just too much of it. So good old Jackie prevailed at the kitchen table and taught me about things like stock to sales ratio, weeks of supply and common financial measures, you know, that you need a trained eye. And you need to have to be able to take the risk to go out and say, this is going to sell and here's why I've done my homework. And sometimes it's a lot of gut feel. Uh, but you also have to have the financial uh, ability to put that within a framework. And that's where I'm having fun now and have had since then. Um, so I can say it's the growth of the top line as well as the bottom line, not just the top line. Yes. Marketing high-end products during a downturn, uh, how is that different from doing the same thing when things are rosy? Actually, uh, getting people to, that's, that's a really good question. In fact, I should have addressed it. I feel remiss that I didn't. Um, getting people to spend, okay, to fund a business in a downturn is one of the most crucial things we can do. I learned it in the Thatcher era. I'm telling you, it was dire. And um, I mean, it was 2009 in the United States, you know, redux. Um, and what we did was I actually uh, got on an airplane and I went to, to meet with Mr. Lauder himself. And I said, you, you have your choice. Would you like market share or protect the bottom line? And he said, what do you mean? And I laid out a plan. I said, if we grow, I mean, if we spend, if I expand my advertising and put in more Clinique counters in the high-end stores and really go after it and add staff, we will gain market share. And I laid out a plan. He said, all right, I'm going to give you a year to try this. I mean, this is this guy who was a rookie. They had never sent anybody abroad before, um, but it worked. And that's how we gained two market shares, and uh, two, two, uh, two ranks. Um, I also told him that we were making a ridiculous amount of money. I literally said that. I said, and the reason why was because we were part of a stable of brands in the United Kingdom and we were funding the brand with his name on it. And so we had to be more prudent. Um, that's why they put me in Japan to fix the bubble. Uh, you know, the, po this, this, the business was, was just almost in shambles because they were still operating under the same way. And so we, we spent money. Um, that's kind of what we're doing now. We are a privately held, rather small, but well capitalized business. And when I laid out my plan to increase our advertising in Vogue, um, to, to expose ourselves uh, in the European market, um, to really, uh, you know, reach out and hire a PR firm and redo our web site and uh, which I invite you all to go on and see, uh, and, and really make the experience come alive, all based on a new product lineup that I had worked hard to lead. Um, we've never looked back. In the last uh, two, and actually sales in, the, in my second year went down because it just took a, takes a while for new product initiatives to hit. But sales in the last couple of years have doubled and profits have tripled. Um, and the reason why is because we're doing something that is so high risk and so unlike any other business. Um, you know, any, any business would like to have a core of products to sell. We don't believe in core. I've convinced them that breadth and flow and excitement because of my ready to wear days is what's enticing to people. So that, uh, you know, based on the research, what's the frequency of how Somebody here goes into Lord & Taylor, let's say, in Westchester. Um, shockingly, it's almost once a week. You know, the average person once a week. So if you have your displays look the same for three or four weeks in a row, they just walk by it. It becomes wallpaper. You constantly have to be fresh. Um, so spending, planning, being aggressive. And <laughs> my owners actually said, if I didn't know you better, I would actually think that you don't want the economy to improve because we're doing so well in tough times when everybody else cuts back. And that's the key. But that was an excellent question. 
Yes. I understand there are a number of, um, as we all know, there are a number of ambassadorial posts that are political. You have to work on a campaign. And mm -hmm. If your man's successful, you might get it. Are you interested in something like that, trying to become an ambassador? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I hadn't thought of it, because in a way I kind of am. But yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Thanks, everybody, for uh, listening. I actually have a gift for you, for each and every one of you. There's one for the men and one for the ladies. I hope I have enough. And if not, I, um, I'll uh, give you my card, and we will make sure that you get one. Um, but I want uh, you to just come down and, and see the product. It's really an interesting line. Um, we have done all sorts of things with Vogue magazine um, as, our, uh, as our advertiser. We just launched Vogue.com this, this past uh, week. Uh, we have designed the, the exclusive tote for Fashion's Night Out. This will be three years running. Um, these may not mean a lot to you, but these are big PR coups uh, in the fashion world for a little old brand like us to, to be the exclusive uh, brand at um, you know, Fashion's Night Out to make the tote. Uh, we appeared at the Golden Globes. We appeared at the <coughs> Emmys. Um, these are uh, particular lounges that invite celebrities and uh, contestants and, and uh, nominees as well as dignitaries from the industry to come and see product and it's what they, they call juried. Um, you, you have to actually apply and be accepted to get in and once you are you're the exclusive uh, of that category. So we were the exclusive handbag brand at the Emmys, the Golden Globes, um, so it's been fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.